next question is from a listener named Abby. And they say, in pursuit of consistent hope, how do you handle bad days, days of discouragement, and or days with bad symptoms? Do you allow days where you just can't push through? Or does that no longer occur to you? Wow, this is a great question. And I'll start it off with a story and a thank you for submitting that question. And this story, I actually heard it from Ben Bergeron, who I'm not sure where he heard it, but it's the wise old farmer. So the story goes like this. There's a wise old farmer who has a son. His son's working on the farm and the townspeople come and visit the farm daily. So they come and one day the son forgot to shut the fence and they had one horse and this horse ran out. So the one horse they had on the farm is now gone. So the townspeople come up, they say to the old wise farmer, wow, that's really unlucky. You don't have a horse anymore. And the wise old farmer goes, huh, maybe. The next day, the horse comes back. It was off in the wild and made all these other horse friends and brought them back. So now instead of one horse or zero horses, they now have multiple horses. So the townspeople come back to the wise old farmer and they go, whoa, that horse went and met other horses and brought them back to your farm. You're really lucky. And the wise old farmer goes, maybe. The next day, the son is working on the farm. He falls, breaks his arm. Townspeople come up, they go, wow, son broke his arm. Doesn't, you don't have the help on your farm anymore. That's really unlucky. Wise old farmer says, maybe. The next day, that town breaks out into a war with the rival town. And the townspeople, they're drafting as many young adults into their military as they can. So their son isn't able to get drafted because he has the broken arm. The townspeople come up and they go, wow, your son didn't have to go to war. You're really lucky. And the wise old farmer goes, maybe. So the moral of the story is oftentimes when things happen, we don't have enough information to determine, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? And we see this happening often with symptoms. So now I'm gonna kind of put this into two different components because we have acute pain symptoms and then we have chronic pain symptoms. But anytime we have symptoms, these symptoms are just a request for change. Or is your body saying, hey, you've had enough of that for today, let's back away from it a little bit, but it's it's a request. So we, we should become curious about that request. Now, when it's acute pain, that's when we, that's when we back, I don't say back down, but that's when we start to become a little bit more conscious of what am I doing? So how do we know that it's acute pain? Well, let's say I'm going for a run and I go to make a cut and I feel this pull in my upper thigh and I'm like, oh man, I think I pulled my hamstring. There's some swelling, there's some redness, there's these other signs that there had, there has been some tissue damage. In that situation, I'm not going to keep running because if I keep running, I'm just going to tear this more and I'm going to prolong or I'm going to make the injury worse and then prolong the healing. So in that situation, we're going to respect those symptoms. We're going to respect it and say, okay, I know why I'm getting this. There's swelling. There's chemical inflammation in this area. I need to respect it and back down from it. Now, in the situation of chronic pain, this is where the script is almost completely flipped. This is where we're going to start putting life, meaning, memories, activities, ahead of the pain. We're not going to let the pain dictate what you're doing throughout your day because it's already dictated you what you're doing long enough. And it's time to put you back in control of that. And in the book, we talk about what is, what is pain because we're, we all experience it unless you have congenital insensitivity in which you don't experience pain, but their life expectancy is like mid twenties. So pain really, it's, it's a good thing for us to have when when used appropriately but when it becomes a chronic thing it tends to be more of a threat or an actual loss of meaningful activity so then how do we start to decrease that signaling well we have to do meaningful activity but how can i do meaningful activity if i'm feeling pain when i'm doing it well that pain doesn't mean that there's damage the pain doesn't mean that the tissue is being damaged any further because the human body is made to heal And when we get out of the way and really allow it to heal, it it does incredible things. Like we talk about in the book, this principle of rice, rest, ice, compress, and elevate, and how we shouldn't do that anymore, because what it's doing is delaying the healing process. And and that's not just an opinion. The person, Dr. Gabe Merkin, who actually wrote about that and coined the term rice in his best uh, 
selling sports medicine book in 1978, in 2000, I think it was 10, he wrote, we shouldn't use this principle anymore because it's delaying healing. So our bodies are made to heal and they're going to heal within a couple weeks. If we get in the way, then we'll say four to six weeks. If it's something like a tendinopathy, well, that's going to be a little bit longer if the person's loading or, or not loading. So there, there's, there's levels to this. But in the situation of chronic pain, all these tests have been done. We know that there's not actual tissue damage there. It doesn't mean that they're not experiencing the pain. It doesn't mean that they're not experiencing the symptoms. What it means is that their body has become conditioned to some type of trigger in the environment that now is creating this behavior. So how do we decondition that response? Well, we have to condition it with other things. So we can't say, I'm not going to go for a walk today because my back is bothering me. No, we have to put that meaningful activity first to rewrite the conditioning behavior. And we have to keep stacking that up over time. It's a, it's a challenging process because it's scary mm -hmm. because everyone has told you we're going to do these things, but it's going to be dictated off of your pain. So we'll, we'll do this, but if you have moderate pain, back away. If you start to feel this, then back away. When the reality is if we had all those other tests done and we know that we can safely lean into it, then let's lean into it. Mm -hmm. And a quick example I can provide here, I worked with this one guy who he had low back pain with sciatic type symptoms down his leg. So numbness, tingling, burning, shooting down his leg. And it happened daily when he would walk exactly at one mile. And he knew exactly where at this mile that it was going to happen at. Mm -hmm. So he had testing done. I, I took him through a bunch of assessments because if we're going to lean into this, we want to be sure that we can lean into it. Like we don't want to have any doubts when we go to lean into it. So let's get as much evidence as we can objectively to say that is it is okay for us to push into this and, and damage isn't occurring. So we did all these core tests. We did all these motion tests. He checked out on all of them, did, did great. And we started to realize that now the response that he's having is a conditioned behavior because he's walking the same route. And when he's walking that route, he knows that when he gets to this mailbox, that it's a mile. And when he gets to a mile, he knows that this is when my symptoms come on. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I set up cones and I had these cones a certain distance apart and I had them carrying different types of weights, different kettlebells and different front rack carry, overhead carry, suitcase carry to distract him. Had him walk a mile and a half, no pain response. Mm -hmm. So now we start questioning, why are you getting this at one mile? Well, it's because you become conditioned to that. When we change the environment, when we change what your focus was on, you no longer had that pain response or that sciatic nerve response. So in that treatment, the solution then became, I want you to walk a different route, one that you don't know. And I don't want you to track it on your watch so that you know when you're at a mile. Because I told him afterwards, how do you feel? He goes, oh, I feel great. So awesome. You just walked a mile and a half carrying an extra 40 kilograms in kettlebells in different positions, taxing your core, and you did great. So you can walk a mile and not have these symptoms, but you have to do a different route to start changing that conditioned behavior. And then once that behavior is now changed, now you can go back into it. And going off that example as well, there's another time, uh, Dr. Tim Gabbett, who um, has become a really good friend and mentor, has a phenomenal course on load management. If you've heard of load management in the NBA or different sports, he really put all the data together to help that explode and really teaches it in a good way. It's like, no, we're not trying to keep athletes out. We're trying to keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. But he was sharing with us that he travels from Australia around the world to teach courses and he loves it. But when he gets onto the plane, he was starting to get these sciatic type symptoms, these nerve related symptoms, which are scary. Like if you've had nerve symptoms down your leg or down your arms, it's a scary situation. And we tend to think that something's pinching on this. Something's bulging into this. Mechanically, something is creating this nerve pain. And the newer evidence has shown, no, that's not really the case all the time. There's a, there's a whole different side to this. So Dr. Tim Gabby started working with a different professional and the professional brought to light, well, what is your thought when you get on the plane? Because this, this is when his pain response comes on when he gets on the plane. He goes, well, my first thought is I'm excited, but I really hope I make it back to see my family. I'm going to a new city that I really don't know anything about. And it's scary. 
Like even as an adult, even having people in those cities, it's scary to go to a new place. Like if you're in Australia and you're going to Chicago for the first time, you're like, okay, yeah, I've heard something about their pizza, but like, what else? Do, how do I get from the airport to my hotel? Is my hotel near the conference center? How am I going to get there and back? Um, am I going to be able to actually connect with people? And, and, and then am I going to be able to fly back to the other side of the world to be with my family again? So these are the thoughts that are going through his head that was bringing on those sciatic symptoms. Mm -hmm. So once he then recognized it, he realized, wow, I need to change my thought pattern because my thought pattern is now creating this conditioned behavior. Change his thoughts. Now that doesn't happen as much anymore. Mm -hmm. It can still happen if his head gets into that thought pattern, but he's creating new and new conditioned behaviors to now decrease that response. So we see it in chronic pain. We see it in chronic conditions. We see it when people start taking food groups away that, that they're being told, well, you can't have that because your body's having that reaction to it. Well, now you've just become conditioned to that. And maybe the behavior that your body is responding to is because of what you've been told and what you've been led to believe versus physiologically what's actually happening in the human body. Mm -hmm. the long, long answer, but I hope that covers it. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's a phenomenal answer. And I think that um, like for me personally, when I was going through my chronic pain, I thought that I wasn't that I'd always have my chronic pain, right? And during that time, I wasn't seeing a doctor consistently I, or anything because I, the doctor situation that I had back when I was a teenager and I was first diagnosed was just kind of dumpy, to be honest. <laughs> and so, you know, they did, they did the best that they could, but like kind of just were like, oh, we don't know. And then I stopped going to a doctor. And so during those years of not really going to a doctor but having chronic pain, I, wouldn't do a lot of things in fear of it flaring up. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, my foot injuries, but then also with back like pain as well. And so there were times where I wouldn't do much, but then I got to a place where, to be honest, I was just kind of sick of not being myself and I would sacrifice. And I would say, I'm okay with having extra pain today. If playing basketball, is going to be joyful in the moment, but I would go into that knowing this might take me out for the next three days. Um, but I really, looking back, I think the thing that helped me heal and, and conquer my chronic pain was being able to go into basketball and say, I'm going to play basketball and I'm going to feel great after it. So my prediction initially was I'm going to play basketball, but for the next three days, I'm going to feel like inflammation and pain in my back and my feet. Now it's, I'm going to go play basketball and I'm going to love it. And I'm going to feel great tomorrow. And I think like that helped me a lot whenever I was going through it. And there's still times where obviously I feel sore. Soreness is different than, you know, the, the extreme chronic pain that I was feeling back then. Um, but to answer, you know, Abby's question, there are times where I couldn't push through. Like I really, I really couldn't push through and I was upset with myself for that. And I think that if someone's in a season where they feel like they can't push through, let yourself be gracious to yourself and don't be mad at yourself. Because if you're mad at yourself when you're not pushing through, like that's mm -hmm. not helping anything. Right. Um, but if you can say, today's just, it's going to be a rough day and I'm going to accept it and I'm okay with it. That's going to actually help the healing process more. Um, but like Dylan said, I you know, Dylan's a doctor. So he has more of the doctoral ways that he's going to explain it, or I'm going to explain it in my like human experience. And I think, I think that's why we balance, you know, in this podcast so well, because you're going to explain the acute pain versus the chronic pain. And I'm just going to kind of share my personal story and hope that it inspires someone, but then you're sharing your story too. But I think that there's, you know, there are days where you need to push through. There are days where you don't need to push through depending on where you're at, but we hope that we can give you more information so that you can kind of look at the broader picture too. Yeah. And, and it's a, a couple of points from that, that it, it's appropriate. Like we offer hope coaching. If someone wants hope coaching to learn more about that, that's mm -hmm. indi individualized to them. Like we offer that because we want people to be back to this. We as a developed nation have the highest rate of chronic pain and chronic illnesses. And, and, and we're a developed nation. We're supposed to have the best technology, the best medicines, the best food, the best things to help people. Mm -hmm. And it's really not the case because our system has placed transactions over transformation. We consume 80% of the worldwide opioid supply. We consume 99% of the world hydrocodone supply. And we have the highest rate of chronic pain. But why is this thing being offered to people? Because of the money that's being made from it. Mm -hmm. So people are being given this thing, but they're not being educated 
on what is a pain experience? When do you lean into this versus, versus respecting that signal? And, and that's our goal is we really want to get people that. You don't need the opioids. You don't need all these other things. You need community. You need gratitude. You need mental fortitude. You need forgiveness. You need movement. You need sleep. And if you have those things, you're going to do really well. Mm -hmm. You're not going to just manage this chronic condition. You're going to get out of that chronic condition. There's research showing that there's 26 different chronic diseases that could be completely prevented with just movement. Mm -hmm. Not even like diving into diet, not diving into gratitude or forgiveness, but just movement. Mm -hmm. So now let's combine movement with sleep, with gratitude, with forgiveness, with, with all these practices wow, we, we have a really good shot to live a high quality, fulfilled life that isn't riddled and ruled by chronic disease. And to the other point for Courtney or anyone else that's listening to this is that if we are struggling, like we do something and, and we need to pull back, there's other opportunities to lean in that day. For example, you say, you know what? I've had it. I'm going to go play basketball. So you go and play basketball and you have a great time and you loved it. But now your foot's yelling at you. That next day may not be wise for you to go play basketball again. But you don't have to lean in just to the movement side. Now you have this response that's talking to you. And instead of just trying to shut it down, because that's what opioids do. They just try to shut down the signal. That's what ibuprofen does. It shuts down the signal. That's what modalities do. They shut down the signal, but they don't actually treat the cause of what's creating those symptoms. On those days, what we can do is lean in to what your body's trying to tell you. Lean in to that pain. The way that I like to explain this with clients is that you are the CEO of your system. And when you come into this life as a CEO, you say, I have an open door policy. Come and talk to me if things aren't going well, which is what all good CEOs do. They come down onto the floor, the distribution lines. They live the life that the employees are living. They go back to their office and they try to make things better for them. So now you're the CEO of your system. You said that you want to have an open door policy, but yet when an employee comes in to tell you something, you're slamming the door in their face saying, I don't want to listen to that right now. That's what we're doing when we have pain and we're taking opioids and doing all these other things to try to get rid of it instead of leaning into what it's trying to tell you. So how many years have you been slamming that door on that pain signal's face? How long is it before that that employee no longer even wants to talk to the CEO? I don't care what you're telling me. I don't care because you're not changing anything. And what happens when the employee gets really, really cranky? <laughs> we're we're going to form a union. We're going to go on strike and we're going to form picket signs and we're going to be yelling at you. There's our chronic pain. It's the employees that are gotten so angry with you not listening to it that they're starting to form to go against you. So now as a CEO, you have to open up that door. And you're going to open up that door and those employees are going to be like, hmm, hmm, I don't know. You said this before. I don't know if I trust this. And you have to say, no, this time it's different. I really want to hear what you have to say. Come into my office. Let's sit down. Let's what is that request for change that you're asking for? Let's go back to the moment that I didn't give you that change. What was the environment? What were the colors? What were the smells? What were the sensations I had? What was happening at that point in my life? Let's experience those things. Let's listen to the employees, which is the nerve cells coming up to the brain, talking to the brain and the brain giving that processing back. But let's talk to these things and figure out what is it that they're actually asking for and then how can we deliver that? So it's not just about leaning into hardcore movement. It's leaning in to the memories, the experiences, the, the things that have led up to this event because we have a threshold for everything. Mm -hmm. So what stacked up to get to that threshold that your body is now yelling at you? Right, and you know, Courtney or Abby didn't specifically say um, pain, right? She didn't say, you know, what are the bad, bad symptoms of this injury, she just said bad symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I love this example because maybe the bad symptoms don't have to do with an injury, like a physical injury. It could be, um, you know, 
OCD. It could, it could be an eating disorder. It, it could be a lot of things. Right. But I think that this example of the CEO is exactly what we are like, that's, that's the answer for no matter what you're going through. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be a physical injury. It can be any of those things. Yeah. And then back to wrapping this answer <laughs> up, this long winded answer, uh, the wise old farmer, mm-hmm. when we have symptoms, we don't know if it's good or bad. Yeah. Because it's a request for change. And that request for change may be a really good thing. Oftentimes when we see people and they're in a lot of pain, something major in their life has happened that they're not dealing with. Mm -hmm. They're not grieving. They're not facing it directly. They're compartmentalizing it, sweeping under the rug and saying, well, I'll exercise it away. I'll run it away. Oftentimes that's what I'm asking runners. Are you running for something? Or are you running from something? Mm. Because if you're running from something, eventually running is going to be taken away from you and you're going to be stuck with those thoughts again. So now if you don't have coping strategies, well, how do we start to work on those coping strategies? By all means, let's get back to running because you love that Mm. and it is a healthier coping mechanism, but we need to kind of lift up that rug, unsweep what's underneath it, face it, and then we can move forward. Mm-hmm. Then we can decide if it's a good or bad right. thing. And I even, I hesitate saying this, but I'm going to say it anyways. I even challenge um, listeners to maybe not label it good and bad because when we label something bad, I think our body processes that very extreme and very negatively. Like yeah. you are good. Who you are is good. Your body is good. Don't label that or whatever symptoms with the word bad because it it goes against our nature of of who we are as human beings. And so you like sometimes I'll instead of saying bad, I'll say rough or challenging or name it for what it is rather than just saying, oh, my bad symptoms like, no, you're you're good. Don't disassociate, you know, and, and let's become whole. Absolutely. You know, which I feel like we could talk for like 13 hours about that. So we should probably oh, move on. But it's such an important message of yeah. that you are incredible and that you are awesome and that you are good and you're always good. We're not perfect. Mm-hmm. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have mess ups. That doesn't define you as being a bad person. We're all good people. And, and we just need to lean into that a little bit. I love that language of I'm a good person, but I'm struggling today. I'm a good person. But maybe I shouldn't have said that thing. Mm-hmm. Like that—that's okay. You're still a good person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. 